Yeah, you too. Go. Thank you. <laughs> hey, Stu. Hey, Larry. All right, Kate, do you? Let's see. Not host yet. Okay. There we go. Now I'm host. Sweet. You would right. like to record this. Yes. Awesome, it is gone. All right. We're doing it. All right, let's let's get going. All right, welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Larry Law. I'm the executive director of the Great Lakes Independent Booksellers Association. I am joined today by Carrie Obrey, the executive director of the Midwest Independent Booksellers Association, and Kate Scott, the program specialist for the Midwest Independent Booksellers Association. Um, some housekeeping up top. Um, so this is our second rep picks. Uh, this is a part. This is part of Heartland Summer, which is our uh, our joint programming between Neva and Gleba. Uh, today's presentation will be recorded, uh, as well as yesterday's education session on um, what's the session on? buying, frontless buying in uncertain times, and tomorrow's uh, author presentations will be recorded. This Friday, uh, all those presentations will be shared and available on the Heartland Fall Forum website and emailed out to everybody in our membership. Um, I want to thank you to our participating reps today, John Mesjak, Sandra Law, and Emily Johnson from Abraham Associates, Jenny Sheridan from HarperCollins Children's, Yanni Demkovich from Milkweed Editions, Bruce Miller from Miller Trade Book Marketing, Daily Farr from Coffeehouse Press, and Darby Gwynn from Peachtree Publishing Company. That will also be the presentation order today, um, just so everybody knows. Um, as well, on the Heartland Fall Forum website, we have Edelweiss collections from all of the presentations today. That'll also be included in the email that goes out this Friday. Um, so the, uh, as far as the, the flow of the presentations today, each rep has eight minutes. At one minute two, I will notify you, you have one minute left. Um, after that, we, will, we have a uh, little room for questions. So if you have a, do have a question during the presentation, please throw that into the chat and we will make sure to get to those questions um, after the presentation. Um, that being said, we're going to start it off with Abraham Associates, and I think Sandra Law is going to take over. I'm going to share the screen here. <laughs> Yay. All right. Hi, everybody. I am Sandra Law with Abraham Associates. Today, I'm joined by Emily Johnson and John Mesjack, and we're going to be going over some of our favorite fall kids picks today. To start out, we're going to go with Candlewick Press, and our first book is Julian at the Wedding. Um, this is the follow-up to Julian is a Mermaid from Jessica Love. This time he's going to be at a wedding that he is attending again with his abuela. It is a same-sex wedding and in this spread you can see there are just gorgeous illustrations. It's just a beautiful book. He ends up making a new friend, Marisol, who is also in the wedding. And as they're playing, Marisol ends up ruining her dress, but Julian ends up saving the day with his magnificent costuming and fashion abilities. Uh, next up, uh, we've got Love is Powerful from Heather Dean Brewer and Louie and Pham. It's based on a real six-year-old girl's experiences. Uh, Mary and her mom are getting ready to take part in the New York City Women's March back in 2017. They're making signs and hoping that their messages will be seen and heard. Mary can't believe that one person's voice can make a difference, but her mom assures her that love is powerful and it's worth speaking up. And the book ends with a great note and a picture of the real-life Mary. Uh, hey everybody, I'm Emily Johnson. Uh, Polar Bear in the Snow is from Mac Barnett and Sean Harris, Total Dream Team. Uh, the simple story follows a polar bear out for a somewhat mysterious walk. We imagine what he could be up to as we follow him through the Arctic landscape. Uh, we find out at the end that he just wanted to get to the water so he could play around for a little while. Um, and the illustrations in this book are just perfection. It's cut and torn paper that add a uniquely artistic perspective to the story. Um, last up from Candlewick is Everything I Thought I Knew from Shannon Takeoka. Um, Bay Area teen Chloe has her senior year planned out. Friends, track team victories, good grades, college applications. But when she has a sudden collapse on the track, thanks to an undiscovered heart defect that requires a life-saving transplant, everything stops. She loses her motivation for all her plans. She can't run anymore. Her classmates have moved on with senior year while she's recovering. But a sudden passion for surfing arises out of nowhere, as does a pattern of wild behavior with a new friend. And that crush on her surfing instructor. And those visions she's having, could those be from her new heart's original person? What will it take to sort everything out, get to the bottom of the mystery of her heart gunner? 
Uh, moving into Chronicle Books, um, If You Can't Come to Earth is written and illustrated by the two-time Caldecott medalist, Sophie Blackall. Uh, this extra long picture book serves as a guide to Earth for anyone who might be visiting from elsewhere. Uh, it's narrated by a young child who explores everything that makes life and our planet magical. The illustrations are super engrossing and impeccably detailed, and it's perfect for fans of Here We Are by Oliver Jeffers, and also This Is How We Do It by Matt Lamoth. Next, we have Sleuth and Solve History. This one's from Anna Gallo and Victor Escondel. Uh, this is a fun crossover for all ages. It's a history-based puzzle mystery book. It's great for anyone looking for something a little different than your basic activity book. In this, you have 20 plus puzzles, half of which you need to use logic and reason. And the second half, you have to use your imagination to try and solve. But very fun, and you learn a lot of good things about history. Uh, next, we have a couple titles from the very exciting brand new publisher joining the Chronicle family this fall. Levine Carrito was founded by Arthur A. Levine. And to say that their debut list is impressive is a pretty big understatement. Um, Little Fox is a lovely and thoughtful hybrid of a picture book and an early reader. The story follows a fox who's out playing and has a bad fall, knocking him out and essentially causing his life to flash before his eyes in a beautiful dream sequence. He, uh, he dreams about being young and about his parents and siblings and all of the wonderful time they've shared together. Visually, the whole book is just super satisfying and the illustrations have a dreamy yet vibrant feel. Uh, next up is Alatsue. Um, it's a set in a very different America where magic is real and is passed down through the generations by the indigenous peoples of our continent. 17-year-old uh, Lipa and Apache Ellie must use all her smart, smarts, her friends and family, the stories about her sixth great grandmother, and perhaps most of all, her ability to raise the ghosts of dead animals to solve the mystery of why her cousin was murdered. It's the most inventive YA novel I've read all year. It's a stunning own voices debut. It's a mystery. It's a fantasy. It's a teen buddy novel with an asexual protagonist. It's got vampires. It's got conspiracy theories. So many ghosts. It's a richly imagined alternate version of the world we live in. Now from Lawrence King, which is also uh, distributed through Chronicle Books, we have Mythopedia from Good Wives and Warriors. This is a beautifully detailed illustrated book that will pair really well with Myth Match from a few seasons ago. It's an encyclopedia of mythical creatures, covers legends, tales, and myths from around the world. Some of the myths included are West African fable of Anansi the spider, to Thunderbird and the whale, an indigenous myth from a number of tribes in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, Myth Match was one of my favorites, and this book is gorgeous. Um, next up from uh, Demond um, and Magnetic Press, which is a publisher based in Chicago, um, we've got uh, Mr. Invincible, Local Hero. It's the recent winner of the Bologna Ragazzi Award for the best middle grade comic. Um, if you check out the spreads here, uh, Mr. Invincible is a collection of single and multi-page comics where your classic neighborhood superhero, Mr. Invincible, fights crime and saves the day and even gets his gardening done. But comic fans of all ages are gonna love the nearly infinite variety of ways that Mr. Invincible breaks all the rules of comics physics, linear timelines, and causality to defeat the villains and get his job done. And sometimes he even gets the job done before the panels run out. All right, and coming from Corto and Wide-Eyed Editions, we have 50 Adventures in 50 States by Kate Seiber and Lydia, Lydia Hill. Since traveling is not necessarily something that we're going to be doing a lot of at this moment, uh, this book turns into a fun armchair travel book for kids. Find out some interesting things to do in each state and learn fascinating facts about different animals and their surroundings. And from Learner Publishing, we have The Most Beautiful Thing from Kao Kalia Yang. Uh, she is, of course, the author of The Late Homecomer, as well as A Map Into the World. Uh, this new book is a profoundly moving and gorgeously illustrated story of a young girl finding joy and contentment through her family's memories. Uh, she has a particularly special relationship with her grandmother, who it helps her to see the value in connections and memories rather than money and things. Um, and it is based on Kalia's own childhood experiences as a Hmong refugee. All right, and from Consortium Books, we have Black Heroes of the Wild West. I'm incredibly excited about this one. This is James, James Otis Smith's debut as an author and illustrator. 
Um, and you learn about three black heroes of the Wild West, and it's an incredible graphic novel from Toon Books. Smith says he was interested in finding stories of ordinary people who lived during Reconstruction. It was, a time, it was the first time black people in America were able to choose where they wanted to live, work, raise their families, and also the first time that they could choose their own names. Some of the heroes included are stagecoach Mary, who was born into slavery and became the second woman and first African-American to drive the highly sought after star route delivering mail in the West. And then we also have Bob Lemons, who was at the age of 22, earned over $1,000 from the Mustangs he was able to bring in. He would track the Mustangs slowly, approaching them several times until they would allow him into their group. He ended up settling on his own ranch and lived to 99, passing away in 1947. I think Larry had a couple things about this one as well. Are you guys done? All right, thank you guys. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely biased, but I'm super excited for this one. Um, like alternative West and Western stories are, are really big right now. You have like Orville Pick and Lil Nas X. So you're getting like alternative, alternative, like, uh, you know, country music. And then you have books like a couple years ago, like uh, Days Without End which is a, you know, a Western with an LG, LGTBQ plus uh, twist to it. And then, um, you know, the prominence of the Compton Cowboys and Idris Elba's new film, um, Concrete Cowboy, I think, uh, um, you know, so it's, it's got a market for it now. So it's very exciting. Um, let me check the chat really quick. We had a bunch of comments in here. Okay. Let's see if we have any questions. Is there an Adelice catalog for the whole meeting? Yes. Um, I will... I can throw that into the chat, but if you go to heartlandfallforum.org and click on the rep picks page, everybody's collection is in there um, under their uh, their name and publisher. Um, let's see. Anything and, else? Um, I think the there question is whether or not there's a collection for absolutely every title. Oh, for everything together? No, we have them broken out into six different collections. I just got an email too about Mr. Invincible uh, from Diamond. It looks like the publisher at Magnetic has approved a placement for the holiday catalog for it, for Gleba. Awesome, awesome. Cool. Wait, not Gleba? From Jen and Sally as well. Uh, what about the first two candlelit oh, titles? What were the first two candlelit titles? Julian at the Wedding and... Uh, Love is Powerful. I'll send you guys the collection. Awesome. Yeah, if you just want to post it in the chat, that would be great. Oh, sure. That is it for John, you want to do that? Yeah, I can do that. Okay. Thank you, guys. Uh, next up, we have Jenny Sheridan from HarperCollins Children's. Kate, uh, would you mind spotlighting her video uh, when Jenny's talking, just to make sure that one's highlighted? Thank you. Okay. Now I'm unmuted. Hi, everybody. I'm Jenny Sheridan from HarperCollins Children's Books. Um, I picked a bunch of titles that Primarily, I think you're not going to be hearing a million different things about. I feel like that's kind of an indie thing, and we're not being able to hand sell, at least right now, the way that we were. And so I know it's a crazy time, and I just wanted to call out a bunch of, you know, little gems that might be sleepers on the list. Um, I don't have spreads. I just have covers. Um, but in the collection, though, for the picture books, there are full PDFs available. So I'm just going to share my screen here. Where is it? Shoot. Mm -hmm. Quite sure how I can share my. Why isn't it here? Oh, here it is. Okay, here it is. Are you seeing my PowerPoint? No. There. Okay. So as I say, I'm going to mostly talk about fall titles, but my, the first title I wanted to bring to your attention is uh, My Hair by Danielle Merrill Cox, which went on sale a couple of weeks ago. Um, I love that this little sweet little board book is primarily for the youngest lap readers of color. And I think it belongs on every new release table and homepage where we've been spending a lot of time lately talking about uh, Black Lives Matter and books that appeal to people looking for books in that category. And this is exactly that for the very youngest readers. I encourage you to go into that collection. This would have been in the summer catalog. So if you're not looking at my markup that I shared for this meeting, uh, you'll find it in the summer listing. It features a variety of hairstyles and skin tones and 
really accessible and just a very sweet little book that I really wanted to do a shout out for. I, I love it. Next up is a jacketed hardcover called uh, Sometimes People March by Tessa Allen. Goes on sale uh, September 1st. Sometimes People March is a wonderful, timely, and inspiring introduction to the power of taking to the streets and making one's voice heard. It illustrates so beautifully how protest is such an essential and patriotic way that we as Americans exercise our right to free speech. Tessa Allen is an illustrator and a teaching artist. This is her debut picture book, which she both wrote and illustrated. Her spare and accessible text is complemented by gorgeous watercolor illustrations that call out recognizable and historic marches. This book is a perfect starting conversations title as it works as a gentle introduction to the concepts of protest and our right to free speech. And if you want to go a bit deeper with older kids, there is additional information about the historic protests and marches depicted in the illustrations in the back matter, making this book perfect for activists of all ages. And I do encourage you to look at the author letter posted in Edelweiss, where she talks about her inspiration for writing this book. The art, I wish that I had spreads to share because it really is, it's so, it's, it's, it's so accessible and comprehensive and just perfect for the, the text. Moving on to my second picture book, The Oboe Goes Boom, Boom, Boom. Uh, it goes on sale uh, September 22nd. And this is, it's very different from the previous book. Um, it's a super lighthearted and fun, colorful picture book about all the instruments in the orchestra and one little girl who thinks she's already found the one for her. There can never be enough books in my opinion like this interactive and hilarious and musical. Kids need to make noise sometimes, and this one gives them permission to do so. This is great for story time or any time, although maybe not bedtime. But, and in the back is back matter that goes through, it, it highlights the uh, musicians that were the inspiration for what's included in the, in the pictures. And I just think it, 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 it's really a lot of fun. Go, moving into uh, middle grade, you're going to be hearing a lot about our new uh, imprint called Harper Alley, which is graphic novels. And we've got several really special books on the fall list, but I think my favorite is this one, A Cat Story by Ursula Murray Husted. Um, goes on sale 10 6. Um, this is the story of two stray cats living on the island of Malta down by the docks. Apparently, there are a lot of stray cats in Malta. Mm -hmm. But the art is just so magical and uh, detailed and terrific. I think that there's crossover appeal here for uh, an adult audience and not just cat lovers, but art lovers as well. Um, it's sort of these two cats who uh, live down by the docks and hear of a mythical garden where they can go and lie in the sun all day long. And so they sort of go on this journey to try to find that garden and they meet all these different characters along the way. The uh, uh, the the author lives in Minneapolis, but um, it really has a very European feel to it. I just think it's a very special book. It's going to be full color, and we're uh, publishing it simultaneously in hardcover and paperback. Um, for the next, for, for slightly younger readers, is The Ballad of Tubbs Marshfield. I've been calling this The Wind in the Willows meets Aaron Brockovich. I think that sort of captures what this is. It's the story of a singing frog, Tubbs Marshfield, who can lighten everybody's mood with his sort of folk, uh, impromptu folk songs. Um, and he sort of dreams of seeing the wider world until suddenly the creatures in this Louisiana swamp start getting sick. And it's up to Tubbs to figure out the, the cause of, of their illness. It has a, a very eco-conscious sort of undertone but very age appropriate when he discovers that the factory on the edge of the um, marsh is dumping pollution into the water and and Tubbs has to figure out how to how to stop that from happening um, it's a very it's a very charming story it's one of my top picks on the list um, I feel like the cover is cute but it doesn't do justice to the subtlety of the story. Um, it, it, I think it would make a great read aloud as well as uh, sort of a just out of chapter books audience. A really special book. 
I'm moving into YA. I just got a couple of titles here. This is not a ghost story by Andrea Portis. I, again, I wanted to pick some books that are not going to be uh, have a huge marketing budget or or be you know on the Today Show and all that stuff. And I thought and you that have one minute. This was a book that uh, really hits a, a nice little niche for uh, your fans of kind of subtle horror. It's a, a, the story of a girl who um, takes a job house sitting the summer before she starts college. She's got some kind of backstory she's not willing to share. Um, it has a little bit of, uh, what was that? I see dead people movie kind of vibe to it, not to give too much away, but um, really, really creepy and really, really good. This author hits it out in park every time. Um, so look for the look for the arc of that one. It's a really, really strong read. I'm still thinking about it, still freaked out by it. And finally, Who I Was With Her by Nita Tyndall going on some, uh, September 15th. This is a story of a teenage girl who in the early pages of the book finds out that a girl from, a, from another school in town uh, has died very suddenly. It was her secret girlfriend of a year and really the love of her life. She's going to have to, but nobody knows that she's by and nobody knows anything about her her sort of secret life it really is i mean i think of teenage girls uh, teenagers who are not living in a place in america where they are uh safely able to come out their parents maybe aren't as uh accepting of who they are and it's about grief and it's about having to do that all on your own when she meets her her departed girlfriend's ex-girlfriend that's when she starts to have somebody that she can share her heart right with. I thought it was devastating and moving and touching and just so very real. So I hope that you'll uh, seek out um, the arcs of, of, of these uh, novels and the effigies of the picture books. Again, they are available. The, the effigies are available in the markup that, that is shared as part of this session. Thank you. Great, thank you, Jenny. Thank you. Uh, Jenny's Edelweiss collection is shared in the chat currently for anybody looking for it. Um, next up, we have Yanni Demkovich from Milkweed Editions. Hi, everyone. Um, I love doing this stuff. It's really nice to see everyone. I'm actually going to share my um, Edelweiss catalog in the chat right now as well, so you can follow along if you would like. Um, and I too am going to share my screen um, and yeah, kick me out, Larry, if I'm going on too long, obviously that's your, that's what you're doing, but really I might kind of ramble. So I'm going to try to do my best to get through this. Um, okay. So, hi, I'm Yana from Milkweed um, and I'm going to talk to you about um, a few of our fall books. One spring book that I just wanted to make sure um, y'all didn't miss. And then a couple poetry titles, I, I kind of anticipated I wouldn't have time to talk about them, but there's a slide for them. And, and I want to hear from you if you love poetry, because I want to tell them or talk to you about it. Um, and also, yeah, I just, I miss you guys. I don't know. Zoom is cool. Zoom is fun. But um, I hope to see everyone in person soon. And yeah, follow along on the Edelweiss catalog if you'd like. I'm going to start with braiding sweet grass. We are really, 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 really excited um, about the special edition that we're putting out in a couple months this October. Many, if not all of you, have sold the paperback of this book extraordinarily well, and we are extremely grateful. And, you know, we came together about a year and a half ago, um, approaching our 40th anniversary, Milkweed Editions is our 40th anniversary this year, and just thinking about all of the generosity that Braiding Sweetgrass um, presents to the world. We wanted to work on a special edition and um, offer booksellers, especially independent booksellers, because y'all have done the grassroots work of getting this book in front of so many readers. Um, something that is hopefully affordable, seems affordable to y'all, and it's just a really beautiful, beautiful gift book. And so this book is going to be gorgeous. Our art director, who is a poet and just a genius, she's picking some really beautiful linen cloth materials. We're going to have a bookmark ribbon and a deckled edge. We're going to have um, color illustrations, which you can see in the Edelweiss, we have uploaded the spreads on Edelweiss, so you can click on those PDFs there. If you're not able to access that for whatever reason, just reach out to me and I'll send you those. They're really beautiful. Um, and then a new introduction by Robin, which is my absolute favorite part. I mean, we have lots of people who come to us, including one of our own um, authors, Sue uh, Huang, who said like, Braiding Sweetgrass is my Bible. I read certain passages all the time. And there's this wonder and astonishment that 
uh, Robin brings to her writing that I thought that if I read new writing by Robin, I couldn't be more astonished by her, and yet I am. She wrote this beautiful, beautiful introduction where she reflects on the impact of the book and just reminds us and brings us closer to the earth and reminds us of that reciprocity that is so deeply embedded in Braiding Sweetgrass. So I just included a little excerpt there just because I'm completely blown away by her writing, but I'm really excited about that. This, again, is coming out in October. Um, it's at hardcover, $35. And I said this briefly already, but really seriously, thank you booksellers. Like, um, we published this book in paperback in 2015, kind of to a slow reception, um, didn't have a huge marketing budget at the time, and it has you know, now reached the New York Times bestseller list, which a milkweed title has never reached before. And it's really because the demand is there, because booksellers keep pressing it into people's hands, and then they, and now virtually, and then they come back and say, I want five more for my friends or for my book club. So we know that you're out there being intense advocates, and we're extraordinarily grateful. Um, we're doing a co-op deal for this, for the special edition. It again, comes out in October. Um, $25 display co-op if you order a 12 copy carton. So if you have questions about that, um, shoot me an email, shoot me a message, whatever. Um, we'd love to make sure you get this beautiful edition in your hands. Um, and next I wanted to talk about World of Wonders. If you were at Winter Institute, which feels like forever ago now, um, Amy was there too. Perhaps you had the chance to meet her. I hope you did because she's She's just a vibrant, she's as vibrant as this beautiful cover. Um, this book comes out in September. September 8th is the pub date there. It's a debut collection from a poet. Amy is a poet. Maybe you've read Oceanic. That's her most recent book with Copper Canyon. Um, and she has been working on this book for a really, really long time because she felt deeply that as a young brown girl who loved exploring her backyard, loved, you know, going into the stacks and libraries and reading about the biology of of creepy crawlies and starfish and whatnot that she didn't really see her experiences reflected in books and or media. So she feels extraordinarily passionate about making sure other young brown girls and, and BIPOC folks feel that their experiences are reflected in literature. And this is very much a book that leans into joy and delight. One of our booksellers, when, when we all were reading the early stages of the manuscript, she said, you know, the world is catastrophic right now. The world is chaos. And I have a lot of people asking me, this is our bookseller, Bailey said this. She said, I have a lot of people asking me, uh, you know, I need a happy book. I need a book that leans into joy and to delight. And I can only recommend um, Ross Gay's Book of Delights so many times. So she was like, I'm just really excited to be able to finally recommend a book that, again, is leaning into this wonder and astonishment of the everyday life. Um, Amy really brilliantly weaves together her personal narrative, kind of a coming of age story with um, stories and little snippets and little scientific snippets about um, the whimsical and wild creatures like axolotls, those little pink salamanders, um, ribbon eels, the corpse flower, which like smells like death, but brought her to her current husband. Um, so it's just a really happy, joyful book. And we've already got a lot of bookseller love. Um, I was happy that Amy could be at Winter Institute, that we could get galleys out early. Um, we have a couple left. So if you are interested, please sh shoot me an email or a message or whatever. I'd love to get one to you and make sure um, that people who come to you looking for this kind of work, that you can sell them in this book. The next book I wanna talk about is The Shame by McKenna Goodman. And um, this book, I totally flubbed the pub date on there. I'm so sorry, it's actually out next month. It's out in August. Um, Electric Literature just published an excerpt of, of this book today um, with an introduction by Chloe Caldwell. So um, I'm happy to send around that link if you're interested or give me a shout if you're interested. It's a pretty lengthy excerpt and gives you a pretty good sense of the pace and kind of the wryness and style of, of this novel, which I am a totally slow reader. I am not just saying that. I'm an extremely slow reader. And I have read this book five times. I'm not kidding you. And the first time I read it, I read it in two days. The pace of it is so intense. You're immediately sucked into this woman's ego, her id. And I felt by the end of it that I could really I was it was like an aurora boris of like I didn't know where Alma the protagonist started and I ended you know and she really wraps you into this into this spiral narrative about that is ultimately a critique on capitalism and motherhood and art making um, with a little social media like kind of bend and twist um, if folks love Sheila Hetty if folks love Sally Rooney Jenny Ophel yeah I know um, you have one minute oh, okay I knew this was gonna happen all right Give me a shout if, you, if you're interested in this book. I'd love to tell you more about it. 
Um, and we all, we already have some bookseller love for it. So thanks everyone who's sending in blurbs and whatnot. The spring book that I wanted to um, kind of circle back to, I talked about this at Winter Institute too, was for Joshua. Maybe you're familiar with Richard Wagamese's novels. This is the first work of nonfiction that we've published. It's an absolutely heartbreaking, gorgeous, gorgeous book um, about his story of, of um, coming back into himself after years of um, you know, the racism of foster homes, um, experiencing some alcoholism, and then eventually how he found writing and, and found his way back to his Ojibwe teachings. Um, beautiful, beautiful book written in letter form to his son, Joshua. Um, and we've got some bookseller love there too. Again, give me a shout if you're interested. I'd love to send you a copy of this book. If you're not sure, I would, I'll send it to you. Um, and I think that's all it'll take. And then we have two new books in our Seed Bank series. Um, one was published back in June and then one is out next month or in September. Um, the Blue Sky is a novel. I found it to be incredibly charming. Um, centers around a young boy in Northern Mon Mongolia coming of age during a time when um, mo the modern ways are essentially disrupting his, his people's traditional nomadic ways. Um, really beautiful. Uh, I actually spun through that one really quickly too, being the slow reader that I am. And then Stone Garland is a collection of Greek um, poetics. So if you're a poetry fan or if you're a fan of Dan Beachy Quick, you will love this one. It's absolutely gorgeous. And then I knew I would run out of time for poetry. So we have some gorgeous new poetry coming out. If you love poetry, I want to hang out with you or like know more about you and I'd be happy to put you on our galley list. We're back to making paper galleys and we're making galleys of all these titles so I'd love to shoot one your way. Um, just hit me up. Thanks everyone. Thank you Yana. Uh, we had a couple of comments in chat but uh, no questions. Um, when you're if you're leaving a comment uh, during the presentation would you I'm gonna uh, make sure the chats uh, the text files are available afterwards so please include the book that you're talking about. Uh, Alana from Schuler said both Amy and her book are a delight. And then Matt and Riley, I think they were talking about shame, said, Matt said, just started it, can confirm it is wonderful. And Riley said, I'll, uh, I'll, need, a, I need, I'll need a copy of that one. So, awesome. Next up, we have Bruce Miller from Miller Trade Book Marketing. Okay, I'm unmuted, I think. <laughs> My name is Bruce Miller, Miller Tribute Marketing. Um, I uh, may have wandered into the wrong room here because I don't have any kids' books, <laughs> but for some reason I was slotted in here, and so uh, I'm just happy to have the attention of anyone who might be watching. If you need to take a bathroom break or you get something to eat, maybe this is a good time for you to do that. But uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, I don't have a PowerPoint either, but I've got a lot of great books. The thing about university presses is they publish books that uh, other people uh, either are afraid to publish, uh, believe it or not, it's not just uh, sort of boring old academic titles, uh, or things that just uh, maybe are a little too complex for what some of the more commercial presses, you know, are willing to do. So I want to put that commercial in. I've got 15 titles in my Edelweiss collection, and I probably won't talk about all of those, but let me talk about a few. The first one is from University of Iowa Press. It's called Kissing Fidel. A Memoir of Cuban-American Terrorism in the United States by Magda Montiel Davis. Magda Davis was a major, uh, was a sort of big time immigration lawyer in Florida and had a big law firm there. And uh, she, uh, in 1994, Fidel Castro came to, uh, for a visit to Miami. And she went to a function at the uh, consulate there and uh, she ended up getting a little peck on the cheek from Fidel. I mean, it was just, it was, you know, the press wasn't there or anything, but somebody gave a videotape of this, this, uh, this social event to the press and it became a huge story. And uh, for her, it sort of uh, drew back the cover on the sort of mafia-like uh, power of the Cuban immigrant community and their CIA connections and so on. She was threatened uh, and uh, her life was turned upside down. Uh, her employees quit publicly on TV and radio and, 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 and they were mobbed with people, uh, you know, thanking them and offering them money and all kinds of things. So she was much hated in the midst of her own community. So it's really a fascinating narrative about that and about the power of the press to vilify people and about, uh, you know, sort of conformity. And I think we're living through a time of conformities in another way. 
um, I think that uh, it's a remarkable book. Um, I talked too much about that, I guess. Uh, then something quite different, a more regional book from uh, Wisconsin Historical Society Press called When White Pine Was King by Jerry Epps. Jerry Epps is uh, uh, Wisconsin Historical Society Press's most popular author. And he's done a book about the age of the lumberjacks and the age of lumber cutting down, you know, clear cutting Wisconsin. It's not about clear cutting so much. It's more the stories about the lumberjacks, the culture of, you know, lumber. And that was really what created the economic boom in Wisconsin, sort of created Wisconsin. So it's really a very entertaining book about that. Uh, then I want to mention from University of Georgia Press, we have a book called Voter Suppression in U.S. Elections. This is very timely. Stacey Abrams is in conversation with a bunch of historians in this book. That's, that's where the book came out of a conference. But it's very readable. It deals with all the issues that are going to affect the upcoming election to determine whether or not Donald Trump is reelected. So there's a lot of excitement about this book. It's shipping next week, I think, or very soon thereafter. Uh, it's a paperback. Uh, I think everyone should have this one because uh, people are gonna eat it up for the election. Uh, let's see, what else have I got here? Diary of a Detour from um, Duke University Press is a, a cancer memoir, but a book that really, really draws you in. And I think I have a quote here that I wanted to share with you uh, from Kirkus Reviews, Advanced Review. What emerges most powerfully is Stern, Stern is the author, Stern's determination to live, not to, to live, not just to stay alive, but as Tennyson writes in Ulysses, to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. A mixture of the mundane and the medical, the ordinary and the extraordinary. That's called Diary of the Detour, and that's from Duke University Press. Um, I've got a couple of books from University of Texas Press. Um, by the way, I forgot to mention Kissing Fidel is a book that was picked by Hanif Abdurraqib. He was the judge for the literary prize that Kissing Fidel won. And I mentioned Hanif because University of Texas Press, of course, published his book, Go Ahead in the Rain, which is very popular. So for music fans who like the Texas books and might know University of Texas Press for uh, Go Ahead in the Rain and, and some other Jessica Hopper's book, um, might like this one called Fangirls. And uh, Fangirls is, is really about the culture of music fans, female music fans, what it means to be a fangirl. Very entertaining, paperback 1795. Um, and let's see, the other book I have, how much time do I have now? <laughs> Am I doing okay on time? Okay. Uh, we have... Uh, uh, just under three minutes, Bruce. Okay, okay. Um, I don't mean to pull a Joe Biden on you. Are we done yet? Let's see here. Um, anyway, uh, this one is called Loving Sports When They Don't Love You Back, Dilemmas of the Modern Fan. This is also from the University of Texas Press by Jessica Luther and Kavitha A. Davidson. And this is really about... Um, you know, all the problems of organized commercial sports, and racism, sexism, and so on. These are both uh, female sports writers and they really get into the, the details on this. It's very interesting and it's going to get lots of press. It's a hardcover at 2695. It'll get a lot of media attention. That's University of Texas Press. Now I have a book from uh, SUNY Press, State University of New York Press. It's a novel called The Immortals. And The Immortals is by a Haitian writer a uh, Haitian writer named Valency Orsell. This is his first book. He's just published or about to publish his third book. All of his books have won, won major literary prizes in France. And this one, The Immortals, is about um, prostitutes in, in, in Haiti. And it's set in 2010 when there was this horrible earthquake in Haiti. It just you know, destroyed the country, basically. And the author lived there at the time. So uh, it's his first book. It's the first book of his to be translated into English. Uh, it's really gripping. I mean, it starts off with a bang right away. You just, you know, you want to see what's going to happen. Um, nothing academic about this one. So I would, I would urge you to uh, take a look at that, The Immortals from SUNY Press. Uh, then I want to mention a book from University Press of Kansas. It's called Last Second in Dallas. Bruce, you have one minute. Okay, Last Second in Dallas is about the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. 
Now, there have been lots of books that have poked holes on the Warren Commission, which, you know, was supposed to explain that Oswald killed him and all that. This book t definitively proves that Kennedy was killed in a crossfire. There were two bullets from different directions that hit his brain. And that's why, if you've ever seen the autopsy photographs, it's such a mess. So uh, the University Press of Kansas is not a radical press. They don't take a lot of risks. They do a lot of middle of the road American historiography. So this book, um, you can be sure, is well documented. And I think every store should have last second in Dallas. Um, the Kent State University Press has the house that Rock built. And this is a, a oversized illustrated book about the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So any booksellers in, in Ohio or anywhere that you know, have a lot of rock fans, it's really a delightful, entertaining book. Uh, let's see. Then- uh, You're right um, at time, Bruce. Okay, all right. Well, thanks everyone for listening. Sorry I didn't have any kids' books. <laughs> Maybe another time. Hey, thank you, Bruce. And Bruce's Adelaide's collection is shared in the chat for everyone looking for it. Uh, next up, we have Daily Farr from Coffee House Press. All right, hey gang, how you doing? It's really nice to see people, whether virtually or in person. I'll take whatever I can get right now. It's really nice to get to talk to you all about books. Um, so I'm gonna quickly touch on a few things that came out uh, just when things were getting really crazy, both in the world at large and in Minneapolis this year, but that I think are really great and could maybe still do well for you. So I'm gonna run by those and then get into some forthcoming stuff. So um, first I wanted to, oh, and I'm not screen sharing. I've just got a stack of books on my desk, uh, old school. I don't trust myself uh, with the fancy Zoom features, but, um, Anyway, first up is um, Sanse and Sensibility by Karen Tay Yamashita, who is just like a legendary coffeehouse author. She's the author of iHotel. Um, this is her latest from us. There are these really bright, funny, moving stories about this Southern California, Japanese American suburbs where Karen grew up with her family, including her sister, who's now a Jane Austen scholar. So some of these stories are kind of autobiographical and some reimagine the plots of Jane Austen novels, but centered in these communities. Um, and they're really great. They examine American history, like the um, legacy of Japanese internment, um, but also they do this really fresh remix of classics and especially Jane Austen in like a kind of heartfelt and fun way. Um, and Karen's just always really funny and fun to read. So I'm still really excited to be sharing these from her. Um, next, I wanted to just mention quickly Thresholds by Lara Mimosa Montes, who is a um, author based in Minneapolis and New York. Uh, she's brilliant. This is really powerful poetry essay hybrid work um, for fans of the kind of Maggie Nelson, Eileen Miles, Wayne Kostenbaum crowd. Um, that's all about the power of friendship and art in the face of grief and pain, both um, personal and communal. It deals a lot with um, kind of the urban desecration of the Bronx in the 1980s and is connected to different filmmakers and visual artists who are also looking at um, that process. Laura's just really smart and while that sounds a little heady, it's also just really um, emotionally moving interesting writing um, that I think could really reach people who are interested in that kind of in-between genre work. Um, next, I wanted to quickly mention Ornamental by Juan Cardenas, translated by Lizzie Davis, who is um, also an editor at Coffee House and a local gal. Um, this, for anybody who liked Kama Madre from us uh, about two summers ago, this is kind of in a similar vein of being like a zany, dark, really cuttingly funny um, medical tragic comedy in translation. <laughs> so we have more than one of those. Um, it just got a really great review in the New York Times um, at the beginning of June, which has really um, given it some steam that we're excited to see. It's just a really elegantly written um, smart little novel about a doctor hired by a drug cartel to test this new drug on women 
uh, and it has surprising effects both for him personally and sort of for Colombian society at large. Um, if you've seen the movie Ex Machina, it's kind of like that, but meets the drug underworld. Um, next, I wanted to, now we're into the forthcoming stuff, so thanks for listening to the old ones. Um, this is The Sprawl by Jason Diamond. Um, you might remember Jason from Searching for John Hughes, which came out from Harper's a couple years ago. Um, so this is his new book of essays with us that touches on some similar themes, um, but is sort of him um, exploring his own um, experience growing up in the sort of Chicagoland suburbs um, and the idea of the suburbs as a place he tried to escape, but which have also maybe had an unexpectedly powerful effect on American art and culture. So he's looking at both like the darker legacies of the suburbs, like redlining and discrimination and things like that that we're acquainted with, but also sort of how um, music, food, movies, uh, all these things that have um, taken on significance and sort of counterculture at large originated from the suburbs and how maybe that can help us like re-examine what those places are like and who actually lives and comes from there. That comes out uh, next month at the end of August. Um, then I am really excited about Pink Mountain on Locust Island by Jamie Marina Lau, uh, which is a really unique, vibrant um, narrative voice from this 23-year-old Australian writer who's sort of exploring this current like vaporwave nostalgia for the 80s and 90s, um, both musically and movies um, and fashion, but through the eyes of um, the smart but lonely teen girl of color living with her dad um, in this tiny apartment and her crush on an annoying older boy who claims to be an artist kind of leads her through this dark and surprising urban underground. Um, so it's this really interesting kind of take on noir um, and is told in these really fast moving intense little vignettes so it really keeps the pages turning too. Um, then I wanted to mention Ramifications by Daniel Saldana Paris. This is translated by Christina McSweeney. Um, first of all, thank you to booksellers for getting behind Daniel for um, Among Strange Victims a few years ago. Um, it was totally due to a lot of indie support that that book was really successful for us. Um, so we're happy to be doing this next one um, and with Christina McSweeney, uh, who just translated on lighthouses, she's legendary. She's done a lot of really amazing work. Um, so this one is a little different. It's way more interior. It's pretty dark, but has this really intense um, and unique narrative point of view. It's focused on a young man who's refusing to leave his bed as he tries to piece apart why his mother left his family when he was a child. And it delivers a really devastating and important twist pretty close to the end of the book. So it's this experience of like this building anticipation and pressure um, before something really surprising happens that changes how you see the whole book up until this later point. That comes, hey, out, you have one minute. That comes out in October. Thanks, Larry. Um, then this is one of the ones I'm most excited to share with you all. Um, one Night, Two Souls Went Walking by Ellen Cooney. Um, I can't stop hyping this one as uh, the perfect hand cell. The writing is beautiful. There's lots of heart. Dogs are involved. There's romance. And it's narrated by this young hospital chaplain as she cares for patients over the course of one night in a medical center. It's really gorgeous and tender, but not cheesy, really smart without being um, snooty at all. I think really a great fit for all kinds of readers and especially for folks who maybe um, wouldn't expect that sort of narrative from Coffee House. It's really powerful. I think you'll really be able to sell it. Um, and then last, I wanted to mention um, Real Bay by Jana Larson. We just got galleys in for this. It comes out in January of 21. Um, it is uh, a cinematic essay is how she describes it, exploring her obsession with the story of the young Japanese woman who died supposedly searching for the money hidden at the end of the movie Fargo. The writing is really rich and visual. 
Um, it's this probing idea of, um, yeah, obsession and um, searching that kind of mirrors um, the, the woman who passed away's experience as the artist investigates what happened to her. And we think that might have a lot of potential for regional interest considering it deals with um, Fargo, Janice from Minnesota. And then one thing I wanted to mention really quick is um, a reissue of Echo Tree by Henry Dumas. We first put it out in 2003 um, and we just announced yesterday that we'll be reissuing it for spring 21. Um, Henry Dumas was uh, a young leader in the Black Arts Movement. He worked with Sun Ra, the jazz musician. He was murdered by um, police in New York when he was 33 years old um, and just sort of had this incredible creative life that was cut short by police violence. So we're really excited to be reissuing this, um, this collection by a revered but too little known sort of luminary of the Black Arts Movement um, alongside Amiri Baraka and Nikki Finney and um, those sorts of people. Um, uh, Nikki Giovanni, excuse me. Um, it's powerful mythic short fiction. Uh, it's about faith, community, Black life in America, and we're really excited to be bringing that out in a really nice new edition. So that's it for me. Thanks, you guys. Great. Thank you, Daly. Uh, we did have a comment in the chat uh, from John Meschak. Uh, I was a huge fan of the Karen Te Yamashita stories this spring when I first read it. He's referring to Sensei and Sensibility. It was a lot of fun to dig under the surface and try to spot the Austin homages. So, great. Last up, we have Darby Gwynn from Peachtree Publishing Company. Hi, everybody. All right. My catalog is in the chat officially. Now let's try sharing the screen. Um, woo! Ooh, did I do the wrong one? <laughs> Hold on. I did have this figured out earlier, I promise. Um, one second. This is the fun part of technology, right? Um, there. You guys aren't seeing it, are you? You take this worked earlier we practiced all right well then here um <laughs> i think if you do a uh, screen share and then portion of the screen i think that's how we got it to work last time yeah you're seeing my desktop aren't you yeah and that's not where i want it here we go boom okay <laughs> can you guys see that <laughs> Boom. Um, yes. Awesome. All right, we're getting on the right track. I promise. Sorry, everybody. Thank you for your patience. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Darby Gwynn, and I'm from Petrie Publishing Company based in Atlanta. <laughs> Thanks for that rough start with me, everyone. Anyway, let's uh, go ahead and get started. All right. So everyone's favorite hardworking hamster is back. Um, if you guys don't know Stanley, he's a huge series of ours that we absolutely adore. Um, and he's sort of this amazing community focused hamster who has all these different jobs. But the author William B really likes to focus on service type jobs. And this time he's highlighting the various ways that firefighters can help the community and keep them safe whether it's saving cats or shrews, stuck in, sh in trees, putting out fires, or making sure everybody's being safe. Um, this book, Stanley's Fire Engine, is perfect for fire safety month in October, or for preschool and kindergarten community helper type lessons. The Stanley series is perfect for younger, for younger vehicle obsessed and tool obsessed kids, and it models this comforting daily bedtime routine that kids will recognize. We also have a lot of activity kits available. You'll see them on all of the screens, um, and I'll point you to the place where you can find those on our website. Now, moving on. All right, this next one, thanks to Francis Perkins. Um, our main publisher, Margaret Quinlan, is actually super excited about this book. Um, well, meet the mother of social security, Francis Perkins. Um, this August celebrates the 85th anniversary of the Social Security Act, something that millions of people are thankful for right now. This timely picture book, biography of Frances Perkins, it zeroes in on the impact on Frances when she witnessed the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire in 1911. 
it propelled her to focus on protecting the weak and vulnerable, um, which culminated in the creation of this of Social Security. As the first ever female cabinet member <laughs> serving in FDR's administration of security of labor, she helped pass laws to establish a rock of security. Um, and that not only included social security, but also child labor laws, unemployment benefits, workers' compensation, and eight hour work days. So it's a great introduction to sort of like kids introduction to economics in a way. And, and the art is absolutely wonderful. Um, the author you also might recognize from like Deborah Hopkins and from Carter Reads the Newspaper um, and Sweet Land of Liberty, two other books that came up with us last year. All right, and moving on to my favorite middle grade that we have on this list, The Candy Mafia. Uh, if you're looking for fun and puns, this book is it. Charlie and the Chocolate Factory meets Bugsy Malone in this middle grade novel by debut children's book author, but award-winning award adult fantasy author, Livy Tadar, or sorry, Lavi Tadar. <laughs> in a city where all sweets have been banned, kid detective Nell Faulkner, while trying to solve a seemingly simple case of finding a missing teddy bear, ends up pulling back the curtain on a secret world of candy smuggling and kid-run black markets for sweets, you know. <laughs> This book's got a great atmosphere and voice that plays on those classic detective film noir movies and the moody spot illustrations and cover by Daniel Duncan. It really captures the spirit of it, everything. And it also kind of has this sort of Steven Universe like feel that I really enjoyed that kids are sure to relate to. And it's also great as a read aloud pick or a middle grade book club pick. Uh, so we went ahead and made a discussion guide available for you. <laughs> All right. Next up, uh, Izzy Gizmo, which actually came out a couple of years ago, but now we're bringing it out in paperback. Um, now this is one of our bestsellers. Izzy Gizmo's inventions are marvelous and magnificent and often malfunction. <laughs> when she finds a crow with a broken wing, she quickly realizes what she must invent next. Now, this is a feisty dick tale about determination and ingenuity and friendship and all of the illustrations throughout that are drawn by, uh, who was it? Oh, Sarah Ogilvy. There's sort of these Rube Goldberg-like illustrations that just absolutely fascinate, at least people like me, <laughs> and hopefully people like you. Um, now, Izzy herself, she's this curious, industrious girl, and she shows consistent emotional stability, even when facing failure after failure. Like Kirkus Reviews said, she's a girl who's allowed to show anger and frustration, and that's what makes this story so important. <laughs> All right. Oh, and her story does continue in the sequel, Izzy Gizmo and the Invention Convention, which came out last spring, if you guys want to check that out. Moving through since we're at, I don't know what time, <laughs> we'll figure it out. Now, Eek, A Noisy Journey from A to Z. Now, this one's written by Julie Larios and illustrated by Julie Pashkis, who we've done, a, we've done a lot of work with. She's an amazing traditional artist, and this book is so much fun. <laughs> um, this collaboration by poet, poet Julie and Julie uh, is a fun story time read aloud full of joy and vibrancy. Using onomatopoeia to introduce the letters of the alphabet, this almost wordless picture book also has a simple storyline for readers to follow and embellish with their own creativity. Overall, it's an awesome visual and auditory experience to inspire imagination and such. Uh, and in the starred review that Kirkus gave us, uh, they called it clever and an absolute zoo of an ABC book, which, you know, I agree with. <laughs> When we also have an activity kit available for that. Next up, we have Little Red, which you guys might recognize because it was a New York Times Best Illustrated Children's Book in 2016. But now we're bringing it to you in paperback. Now this is the beginning of our whole cycle of getting the other two done, uh, Rapunzel and Hansel and Gretel down here. Now with some really cool inter- now, oh sorry, this book has the coolest little book flaps on the front that I think I've ever seen. So they're these interactive French book flaps that Beth and Wolven did design for the book. So be sure to check it out. Now, as you know, this was Bethan's debut children's book, which came out in 2016. 
Um, it was on a bunch of best of year lists and with the striking three color illustrations, this fractured fairy tale features a smart and cunning protagonist and a subversive surprise ending, giving the classic tale a sort of refreshing modern spin. Um, I certainly like to call Bethan's, well, Bethan's whole little collection of the feminist fractured fairy tales. Um, and you kind of got to read them to figure it out. But as SLJ said, this is how fairy tales were meant to be told. Darby, you have one minute. Thank you. We're going to blow through. Now, if you guys don't know Madeline Finn, you absolutely should. Uh, this is the last book in her little trio about uh, this wonderful little girl who really hates reading, but learns how to really love it thanks to uh, a therapy dog that shows up at her library. Um, she ends up adopting a puppy in the second one, and then this one is her, that puppy star's chance to finally get certified as a therapy dog herself. Um, and to save time, we're going to keep going. This is the YA on my list today, Sing Like No One's Listening. It's perfect for fans of musical theater, Broadway, performing arts. The story follows Nettie Delaney, a teen who's about to start at a performing arts school, but the problem is, is that Nettie can't, hasn't been able to sing since her mother died recently. And so it's got this wonderful diverse cast of characters and it covers important topics like bullying, pressure, grief, and body image. Uh, we also have a discussion guide if you wanna pick it up for a YA book club. All right, two more, let's see how fast we can go. Nina Sony, former best friend. This book also came out a couple of years ago, but we are also starting to publish this one in paperback. Um, it's a wonderful book to sort of buff out your uh, own voices collection because Kashmir Sheth wrote this story about a wonderful, quirky, left-brained girl uh, about her daughter. And it's a really, really wonderful book. Um, we have we have Sister Fixer, Nina Sony Sister Fixer that came out and that one's coming out in paperback soon. And then in spring 21, we have the third Nina Sony Master of the Garden. She's a steam sort of focused girl. So it's, it's gonna, it hits a couple buttons. And then my last one, flash through. Williams, William Still and his Freedom Stories, written and illustrated by Don Tate. Now this is the first ever picture book about the father of the Underground Railroad, or rather he was the record keeper. Williams, or yeah, Williams still, his parents were enslaved people that escaped to freedom, and so he's born free. But then as he grew older, he started keeping records of all of these freedom seekers that he encountered. Um, and he ended up connecting a lot of different families once they gained freedom, including his own. So Don did a lot of really extensive and wonderful research. And the end papers are like William Still's actual records. So it's got some cool little things. And if you have any questions, <laughs> because I went a little fast, uh, feel free to reach out to us at any time. Um, I'm 100% here for it. And thank you for your time. All right, thank you, Darby. <laughs> thank you, Larry. That wraps it up today. Um, uh, one more time, I want to thank our participating reps, John Mesjak, Sandra Law, Emily Johnson, Jenny Sheridan, Jana Demkovich, Bruce Miller, Daly Farr, and Darby Gwynn. Um, like I said at the beginning, all of these presentations uh, are recorded. They're available on the Heartland Fall Forum website and our YouTube channel, uh, as well as all the Edelweiss collections. Um, if you have any questions, please feel, to, feel free to jump in. Uh, we're right at time, but really quickly, I want to mention that, um, oh, yep, carry through in the chat, uh, tomorrow's author event uh, registration, there's a link in there. Um, to join it. It's at the same time tomorrow, Thursday, 1 p.m. Central, 2 p.m. Eastern. Um, I also wanted to mention that uh, Gleba and Miba, our holiday catalog, we're currently taking bookseller recommendations uh, through Friday. So uh, on the Gleba website, if you click on the holiday catalog tab, there is a section for booksellers to uh, recommend titles. And Carrie and Kate, are, do you have a link on your website or do you want the booksellers to email you? We're going old school, just send me an email. Perfect. Awesome. All right. Uh, thank you. Couple, uh, is cat heavy. <laughs> Couple comments on about our cat in the chats. Uh, <laughs> uh, so that, that pretty much wraps it up. Um, thank you all for joining us and uh, please look out for the invitation to tomorrow's event. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Bye. Thank you.